Okay. Okay. Cool. Fifteen. So much for a paperless society. Yeah. Call the meeting to order and ask you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of, of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning and welcome to the December 6, 2022 meeting. I would remind you to silence your cell phones. The meeting documents are in the back corner in the white folder if you'd like to peruse those. If you plan on speaking and you're not on the agenda, if you would just sign in with your name and address, and when you come to the podium, if you would give your name, your position, and um, your county of residence. You don't have to give your full address anymore. Um, with that, I would add to ask to add to the agenda um, a, an agenda item of Multicultural Center, Center to follow item number 11. Move to amend the agenda. Second. I have a motion and a second to amend the agenda to add it following number 11, the Multicultural Center. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Next, I would uh, ask for a motion to approve the amended agenda. So move. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Next, we go to consent agenda. Um, is there a motion to pass consent agenda? Second. And motion and a second. Roll call vote. Bender. Aye. Barth. Aye. Benega. Aye. Karski. Aye. Heiberg. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to regular business. Um, item number 10 is a public hearing to consider the on sale, the retail on sale wine and cider license for Friendly's Fuel Stop in Baltic. Kim Christensen. Good morning, Commissioners. Kim Christensen with the Auditor's Office. Um, we received an uh, application for a 2023 retail on and off sale wine and cider application from Friendly's Fuel Stop in Bal uh, located outside of Baltic. This license would allow the sale of wine and cider beverages at their establishment in the county. The application has been reviewed by the Sheriff's Department, State's Attorney's Office, and Planning Department. No questions or objections were reported. They currently hold an on and off sale malt beverage in South Dakota farm wine license. The fee for a new license is $500 plus a publishing fee. Any questions for Kim at this point? Okay, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of the um, wine and cider license? moving is there anyone who wants to speak in opposition um, it's moving move okay. approval second I have a motion and a second to approve the retail on off sale wine and cider license in Baltic um, roll call vote please Kursky aye Benega aye Barth aye Bender aye Heiberger aye motion passes unanimously Item number 11 is consider a motion to approve the final draft submission for the just home, excuse me, I think we're doing a briefing instead. Okay, we're changing this to, it's a, just going to be a briefing without a motion on the final draft submission of the just home grant implementation period by Paige Miller. And I think Paige is online. Um, we, have we have to do what? It'll be in the next okay, do we wanna do the next item? Or do we, okay. We're going to do the multicultural center that we added. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning, members of the commission. My name is Rebecca Kiso Knutson. I'm the president and CEO for LSS of South Dakota. I'm here just to give you an update on our progress with the integration of the multicultural center into LSS. Um, 
a little bit of history. The Multicultural Center has been in our community for over 25 years and has been working to make our community a welcoming place for people from all different backgrounds. Um, had been in a search for a new executive director and were having some challenges there, so approached LSS about integrating operations into our agency. Uh, so um, as of October 1st, LSS assumed management responsibility for the Multicultural Center um, and have uh, been working to um, really continue the good work that has been done in the past, but also do a little bit of revisioning for how the MCC moves forward into the future. Uh, very excited to announce that we hired Valeria Wicker, who's not yet here this morning. I was hoping that she would be here so you could get oh, an opportunity. Here she goes. Here's Valeria. Uh, an opportunity to meet Valeria. Um, so Valeria joined us as of November 1st and um, has is going to assume leadership responsibility for the MCC. Um, just a, a few things to note. Um, you know, one of the strengths of joining with an agency like Lutheran Social Services of South Dakota is that we have a really strong administrative backbone can, that can help to propel the work and create some efficiencies for the mission of the MCC. Um, all of that has already started to happen. So our philanthropy, IT, HR, all those administrative functions are sort of wrapping around um, the program, and that will allow Valeria and her team to really focus in on the mission of the MCC. Um, so you have a briefing memo that talks a little bit about what will not change relative to this transition. So we'll continue to do our um, fee-based interpreter services, but we're merging the two programs. So we had a program at our Center for New Americans that will become one with the MCC. Um, we'll continue our focus on community engagement and really reaching out into the diverse communities in Sioux Falls, um, engaging that mission. Also focusing on workforce development um, and driver's ed programming, which we just received a any of that that might occur um, some of the other things we did we have always have a challenge of getting uh, election workers we need more and more each year so we did use an online election worker sign up form to recruit staff uh, that really helped uh, received a lot of interest that uh, from that um, we hired about 12 part-time staff to assist with absentee voting so this, when I say part-time they're in the office um, five days a week eight hours a day so uh, they were, they were um, we need all of those, and we could have used probably more if we would have had some space. Um, the use of the newly remodeled space here in the third floor of the administration building was very successful. Um, you know, the space that we used, the flex space outside this room for absentee um, voting, was uh, very uh, uh, worked very well for absentee um, voting period. And then when we had on election day, when we used the, the training room next door along with the flex space for the absentee vote. Uh, opening that worked out very well. I think the um, space in here that we use for tabulating of the votes that, on that night also was, uh, worked out very well. So uh, I think we should think this is a success, the, uh, at least from the election perspective of the, uh, the remodeled space up here. Um, can I just give you a scope of the number of people we had to hire uh, to put on the general election? We, we hired about 500 election workers. That's a combination of poll workers, absentee workers, people in the office, all the, all the other tasks that we need. So it's a, it's a big undertaking to recruit all those people. Uh, just about 100 of those uh, work, workers were just doing the absentee boards, over 350 out in the polls. So, um, and then 50 just miscellaneous help around. So um, yeah, it just needs, takes a lot of, uh, recruitment and um, get enough people uh, to help us put on that election. Uh, we, did have, we did have some things that we need to work on um, from the election that we noticed. Uh, so we did have some wait times at some of the precincts in the high growth area, especially on the eastern side and, and the far western side where we've had a lot of growth in Sioux Falls. The number of voters uh, has increased in, in, in a lot of those precincts. So they had over a 30 minute wait time is something that uh, we need to address. So what we've done on that, we've um, we've begun to have some discussions with our GIS uh, department to help us 
understand the number of voters in each precinct to see if we can if we might need to add uh, precincts. Uh, we had a conversation with uh, the city of Brandon, um, understand how we can maybe help get that a little bit more even. We're meeting with the city of Sioux Falls um, this week to talk about their precincts. So uh, we're gonna try to address those wait times that we might see. Hopefully at the same time, we're also trying to address the issue we have with some of the precincts that have uh, more than one legislative district. We'll try to minimize that number as uh, best we can. But I think overall, we had a successful um, general election. I, I don't think we had any major issues. It went off pretty well um, from the lack of comments I've had anyway. So I felt pretty good about that. Um, so that's kind of my update. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Questions from the commission? Just Ben, thank you. We do feel like you ran an excellent excellent election and we're happy it's over yeah. and i'm sure your staff are too so yeah thank you right. very much thank you madam chair uh, Mission. Board, are we doing public input after oh sorry yep we can i forgot that part is there any public input on this item okay none um do we have our okay we're going to go back to Item number 11, um, which is a briefing on the draft submission of the Just Home Grant Implementation, Dr. Paige Miller. We're getting there. Start video. There it is. Can she hear? There she is. Good morning, Paige. Good morning. How are you? Great. I don't know if you heard. I introduced what we are doing here, that we're having a briefing on the Just Home Grant implementation. And so if you just want to identify yourself and your position, and then we will move forward. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody. I am Paige Miller. I am the new-ish Associate Director of Research at the Center for Rural Health Improvement at USD. Okay, and you want to just get, start that briefing? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me. Um, I've been tasked this morning with, as Melinda said, to provide you all with um, just a brief overview of the work that's been done related to the Just Homes project. I'm sure that you all have heard some of this information before, so I'll go over just a, a quick overview and, and let you know where we are and a timeline for moving forward. Um, so as, as, as I'm sure, all of you are very well aware Minnehaha County has been funded through the MacArthur Foundation to be a uh, safety and justice challenge site um, tasked with safely reducing the jail population in the area. Um, in the early spring of 2022, the MacArthur Foundation, in collaboration with the Urban Institute, they um, announced an initiative that's sort of a supplemental initiative um, to the SJC's work um, in that it's uh, uh, designed to address housing instability and housing issues for those recently released from jail, um, recognizing the links between housing and, uh, and recidivism and, and things of that nature. And so four sites were selected to receive funding as part of, of this, this work, this housing work, one in South Carolina, one in California, one in Oklahoma, and then of course us in South, South Dakota. Um, and so, uh, Beginning last spring, the Minnehaha, Minnehaha County team, um, as well as these other sites, we were tasked with developing a housing improvement action plan, um, a HIAP. Um, and I actually sent you all an outline for that HIAP. I don't think I have the ability to share my screen. I, I posted up here if, if that was helpful, but I did also send it to y'all. Um, so the HIAP outline is um, sort of maybe the document that would be easier for you to look at as opposed to the full draft. Um, so the Housing Investment Action Plan, or the HIAP, this is the first draft of this was due in October. We received feedback on that plan, and we are now in the process of, of uh, implementing that feedback for a final submission in December December 16th, um, so just a couple of weeks from now. Um, and so just to, just to give you a sense of how the, the work uh, and the plan that I'm going to briefly summarize here in a moment, how this developed, um, this is prior to my my coming, but I've 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 gotten a sense of the work um, since I've been here in August. Uh, in order to 
uh, begin the, to build out the planning process, the Minnehaha team, they developed a number of committees. They have a, a, a steering committee. The steering committee, uh, they their task is to sort of drive the direction for the plan. Um, the steering committee serves as really the decision-making body, um, and, they, and they sort of determine uh, – they they serve as a decision making body and determine the stakeholder committee's decision topics. So um, the steering committee these are folks uh, a, divi a diverse array of folks are represented. You've got the Minnehaha County Sheriff's Department. You've got the Sioux Falls Police Department. Um, uh, the South Dakota Unified Judicial System, Human Services, Affordable Housing Solutions, among a number of other folks. So this is the steering committee. Um, the steering committee then works alongside, I mentioned the stakeholder committee a moment ago. They work alongside the stakeholder committee. The stakeholder committee is rep includes representatives from a lot of the same agencies as the steering committee. Um, but again, basically just folks who have on the ground, everyday real world experience um, working in this area, providing social services, uh, uh, providing housing solutions for folks who need it, keeping the community safe. Um, so you got, you got the stakeholder committee, the steering committee, and then you've got the coordinating committee who sort of acts as a bridge between these two these two other entities, ensuring that the sort of conversations that they have separately, that they come together in a, in a unified plan. And I think um, my sense and, and from talking with folks and being in these meetings is it, the, the setup for the planning process um, occurred in this way for two reasons, really, to ensure that you know the necessary perspectives were included in these discussions, um, and then also to ensure that as much as possible, this planning is, is transparent, so that you know nobody's caught by surprise at the end of it. Um, and so, these two committees—they've been working together. Uh, and if you're looking at that high app outline, um, you'll see that the uh, the plan is really through this process um, there's a, a two-pronged approach to addressing the housing situation for incarcerated individuals in Minnehaha County um, the the planning process the, the people on these two committees identify two populations we've been calling them population A and then population B so um, population A these all, all of course both both populations are folks who um, are uh, folks who have been incarcerated. Population A are people who have been out of the jail system for maybe one to two years. So not a long time, but a bit longer than population B. We've conceptualized this, this population or we hope to target people um, for this population who have um, uh, we've been talking about it as they're just a bit more stable. They're more on their feet. And what we mean by that is they, they have housing needs, but um, maybe they're able to keep, you know, a job, a steady job, but they are finding that it's difficult to um, secure housing because of their criminal history. So that's population A. And then population B, these are folks that, that we've kind of we want to target people who are more recent released from jail, so maybe that less than a year they've been out. Um, they are also people who uh, are maybe not as secure as that population A. So they, in addition to their housing needs, they might struggle with keeping a job. They might sort of struggle um, more intensely with maybe substance use disorder or things of that nature. And so they need because of those that that um, because of that situation, uh, population B. These are folks that we see as being in much more need of uh, sort of secure uh, case management, um, a more uh, structured uh, plan to, to help them be successful post-incarceration. Um, so you've got these two populations, and then we, uh, we have two sets of funding uh, for this work. Um, for, so from MacArthur and Urban Institute. So there's the PRI funding, which stands for Program Related Investment. And this is uh, in, in the range of $3 million. And we are we will be using this funding in a, in a two-pronged approach as well. So approach one is going to be to use that funding to expand, um, to, to develop uh, 51 units um, expanded on the Glory House, what they already currently have. Um, so this 51 unit um, low income housing situation has already uh, been approved. The tax credit has been approved just recently. Um, and then approach two is to, um, it, as a more scattered site 
uh, a plan. And what I mean by that is we will work with landlords who are uh, willing to work with us and um, who've been on board, who've, uh, who've kind of committed to this process. Um, we will work with them to provide funds to, you know, incentivize their participation. So there's a certain amount of risk potentially in, in, in this plan. And so uh, part of what we'll, our, our plan is to provide them funds to renovate units, um, to even provide maybe like a, a bit of a, you could think of it as like a safety net so that if if something does go wrong, that they have funds to recoup any losses that they might experience. Um, so that's the first set of funding, um, the PRI funding that will be used in those two ways. And then on top of that, there's also programmatic funding um, in the range of around 640,000. Um, and this funding will be used to, for programs, um, for evaluation and program management, um, for uh, that, yeah, so mainly those two issues. Um, the the timeline for this, I've mentioned, I've mentioned a lot of it already. But so we had the the first high app draft that was due in October. We are now working to incorporate that feedback. We will be submitting the um, sort of final high app draft that housing um, improvement action plan. Um, we'll be submitting that draft December sixteenth. Um, once we what after that period, there will be a planning period that stretches from. Um, early spring, so January to the end of February. Um, that's the planning period. And then there'll be an 18 month implementation implementation period that begins in March. Um, and so I think that the some of the details, the planning period from January to February will give the Minnehaha team a chance to um, to dig out some of these details or to elaborate on some of these details a bit more. Um, so we'll get into the specifics of the budget and that kind of thing, particularly for the programmatic pieces. We have a sense of the broad categories, but some of the um, specifics there will be fleshed out during that planning period. And I believe at the end of that planning period or sometime in that January, February period, um, the intention is to return to the commission um, uh, for a formal approval process. And so that's the sort of quick and dirty overview of, of the work that we've done and how we've gotten here and what the plan is moving forward. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I believe there are folks in the room as well who um, who might be able to answer some questions as well. They've got a bit more of the historical background. Um, so thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Is there anyone in the audience who wants to speak on this agenda item? Not seeing anybody move, Paige. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Bender. Microphone. I really appreciate the work that you've been doing. Sorry, I didn't have my mic on at the beginning. You sign. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new process for us. We didn't used to have to turn on our mics. So anyway, thank you very much. We look forward to hearing back from you um, in early spring. I, I, I just think you're an eternal optimist when you call January and February in South Dakota early spring, but I, I'll go with that. So thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? And this is a really a great profit, or, um, partnership with our nonprofits and some of our community members. It's, there's a long list in this draft formula, or draft of people who are working this project. So it is like herding cats, I am sure. So thank you very much, Dr. Miller, for jumping on with us. With that, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is item number 13, consider a motion to approve the renewal application for medical cannabis dispensary license. Kim, again, she gets to run today. Good morning again. Um, Kim Christensen with the Auditor's Office. Um, we have received the renewal application for the Medical Cannabis Dispensary License for Genesis Farms LLC. According to Minnehaha County Ordinance 2061 passed on October 5th of 2001 in South Dakota codified law, Minnehaha County will issue one medical cannabis dispensary license that will be regulated by the state of South Dakota for operation within Minnehaha County at any given time. We will not, <coughs> will not issue a license um, to any cultivation facility, testing facility, or project manufacturing facility. On October 15th of 2022, the initial license was approved by the Minnehaha County Board of Commissioners following the random selection process and review pursuant to Ordinance 20 or 60-21. 
According to resolution 2155, the renewal fee for a medical cannabis license is $25,000. There's a $5,000 application fee. The auditor's office has reviewed the application the renewal application against the requirements set forth in the ordinance, along with a view by the state's attorney planning department, as well as the sheriff's department. <coughs> no questions or objections were raised. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Are there any questions for Kim? Okay, is there any comments from the public? I see Emmett is here, so maybe Emmett, you wanna say something, and then I think we may have some others that wanna comment too. So if you just identify yourself and your residents of count, county residents. Good morning, Emmett Reistroffer, Chief Operating Officer of Genesis Farms uh, from Sioux Falls, but I do live in Rapid City now and uh, go back and forth frequently um, for Genesis. And just wanted to give you a quick update as part of this renewal um, as to where we're at in the process. Um, if I recall correctly, um, it was around this time last year um, when the county held the lottery to award um, its one single license to an entity. There was really two different groups, I believe three entities, but two different groups of people that participated in that lottery, and we were very fortunate enough to be selected. Um, since that time, uh, we then worked through the administrative process. I believe we received our county license um, on March 15th or around that time. Um, I might not have it down exactly, but um, I believe it was a couple months later we re received the county license, at which time um, I then finalized the requirements for our state license, which I received on May 6th. Um, I point that out because the state has a one-year timeline um, which state regulations require us to become operational. So our goal has been and still is to become operational by May of this year. Um, I'm here today because Minnehaha County does its licensing based on the calendar year, um, but I just wanted to point that out that it actually hasn't been quite a full year yet. And so that's why we're not open for business yet. Um, it does take quite a bit of time, especially at this location when there's a current tenant that is in the process. And as you all know, um, quite a bit of work around the, the new highway redevelopment there at that corner. Um, so I've been leaving it to the architects and engineers to work through some of those issues and that current tenant to move to their new location. I have been told they will be out by March at which time uh, Genesis and our contractors can get to work um, to begin preparing the site to become operational by May uh, of this coming year. So we're not open for business yet, but I still um, am sticking to the same business plan I presented to you before. I know it was quite lengthy. I won't get into it again, um, but if there are folks from the public here that have questions or concerns, I'm happy to respond to any specifics. Um, it is a very robust security system. Um, I'll just emphasize that, that safety is our number one priority, being a good neighbor, being a good role model. I know this is a brand new program um, and there's only two dispensaries in Sioux Falls open so far. Um, there could be a total of six in Sioux Falls if you include the county license uh, in this area uh, in, within the next year. The patient count continues to increase as more and more physicians uh, register with the department to provide the recommendations. Um, and I'm constantly hearing from patients asking me, when are we gonna open? Um, because they would like to start accessing our product. And um, like I said, most of my focus has been on our wholesale operations um, for the past year. We're now operational in Box Elder um, with the 20,000 square foot cultivation manufacturing facility. And I'm just getting ready to head back later today to start setting up um, our lab where we have a state-of-the-art lab to make non-smokable products um, like tinctures and vaporizers and edibles and we hope to provide a variety of affordable products to help every patient who needs it. Um, so that's Genesis and it's nice to see you all again in a nice new beautiful room and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks Emmett. Any questions for Emmett right now? Okay, is there anyone else who wants to speak on this subject? Go ahead, just identify yourself in your county, please, and then make sure you've signed in in the back. Yes, I did. Uh, my name is Anita Leslie, and I live in Minnehaha County. Uh, my husband and I own a single-family dwelling uh, located within 1,000 feet of the 7605 South Dakota Highway 42 uh, proposed address for the medical marijuana dispensary, apparently owned by Genesis. According to zoning, our home is 509 feet from the proposed dispensary and we respectfully object to the medical marijuana dispensary license renewal application submitted by Genesis for this location. 
um, we do not support a dispensary so close to a sensitive use property. We are licensed foster care providers. I've done foster daycare. I do respite care. I do emergency care, and I've taken long-term um, foster care for many, many children out of this home. Um, we are business friendly, and we believe that the requirements of the setback rules of sensitive users are important. And this particular location is well within the distance of several sensitive use properties. Um, we were not informed of previous attempts to attain a conditional use permit or we would have been here earlier. Um, it was brought to our attention by our neighbors. So we understand that certain testimony was made by Emmett Reistroffer and Chrissy Johnson back in February 28 of 2022 at the commission meeting. Um, it relates to inferences regarding approval from our neighborhood. We are an HOA. We have 12 or 13 homes on our street. Um, we really question whether proper communication was made. I have letters um, from my neighbor across the street. It says, we live closer to the proposed location for the medical marijuana dispensary than any of the other homes in the Oakmont development. We were not contacted by Emmett Reistroffer or anyone else to voice our disapproval. We strongly object to the renewal application submitted by Genesis. My neighbor two doors down was contacted. Um, she stated in her letter, there was a lady that did invite me to a meeting to discuss the benefits of medical marijuana, not a meeting to inform us a medical mar marijuana dispensary was being proposed at a commission meeting. I did let the lady know I did not support it and would not be at their informative meeting about the benefits of cannabis. I now know that woman was Ms. Johnson. So we believe the writers of the original law gave ample consideration to the suggestion of 1,000 feet as a reasonable distance for sensitive use locations, such as the fire department right down the street, daycares, and homes. And we agree. We would appreciate the support from the commissioners we ask that the conditional use permit be denied. We believe we should be protected by the law set in place stating that dispensaries should not be within 1,000 feet of a sensitive user. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Um, I just have a question because that is, has to do with the conditional use and not the license. I don't know what are correct. I said that her comments have to do with the conditional use permit and not the renewal of the license, if I'm understanding correctly. Can we have Scott comment on commission, conditional use permit and how that could be, um, or if that can be um, challenged? Uh, Scott Anderson, planning director. Um, the conditional use permit was submitted an application, we went through the proper hearing notice. A conditional use permit was required because it was within the 1,000 feet of, uh, of a sensitive use, um, the fire department. So we uh, he held a hearing. Uh, the hearing was on the agenda. Notices were sent out to all the proper property owners within 500 feet, and uh, we, we held the hearing. Whether a conditional use permit can be challenged, you know, nearly a year after it was approved, I would um, defer to our legal counsel on on what that process, you know, would entail, uh, and uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions if you specifically have any questions for me. Um, if we didn't, if people didn't receive their <clears throat> notices in the 500 feet, or is it 1,000 feet? It's 500 feet. It's 500 feet. It's 500 feet. So it would have to be within the 500 feet to receive notices. The applicant certifies that they mailed out the notices uh, to everyone within 500 feet. And that is the procedure that we follow for all conditional use permits. Okay. Do you have any comment? <clears throat> Do you have any comments? No, I would suggest that those folks that may have some issue have their counsel contact them and have a conversation. Oh, microphone. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> would suggest that uh, anyone that had concerns or complaints about the condition of use permit have their counsel contact me, and I'd be happy to have that conversation with them. Uh, I understood your testimony this morning to be that your home or residence is 509 feet away from the establishment, so. 
may not have been one of those required to receive notice, but I can certainly have that conversation later. Commissioner Karski. So clarify, we're not, what we're, action we're taking today is to approve the renewal of Correct. the license, yes. which has nothing to do with Correct. the conditional use permit. Just answering their question because that came up and we will continue on with the license. Okay. If there are no further questions, any questions on the license, Commissioner Barth? Um, so did the applicant pay us $5,000 last year and is now paying us another? Yes. I see Kim is nodding yes, so yes. Uh, this is a renewal at the, at the rate of 5,000, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I need a motion, Th and this is on just the um, renewal of the application for the license. I'll make a motion to approve the renewal. I'll second it with a comment. Commissioner Bender. I just I don't see that we have any basis for not renewing the license. The business hasn't even been open, so they haven't violated any provision <laughs> in their licensing. So I, whether we approve of a marijuana or not, this is where we are, and so I second the motion. And I would say the same, we, there's nothing we can do. I mean, that's part of the law. That's why we, we follow the law and we have to, so. Um, I have a motion and a second to approve the renewal. Roll call vote, please. Barth. Aye. Bender. Aye. Kursky. Aye. Benega. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Madam Chair. Commissioner Bur For Kursky. future reference, I guess, if there were some violations of the statute or um, of the conditional use permit, that would be the time that we could take action to non-renew the license. But Correct. as long as they're in compliance with everything that they said they would do, um, we really don't have, we don't have a lot of option. Yeah, so. and there would have to be an error in the conditional use permit, and then that would be a totally different conversation. So, all right. With that, we'll move on to item number 14, which has authorized the auditor to post notice of a budget hearing for December 27th, 2022, consider supplement requests to the 2022 budget. Susan Beamer. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, Susan Beamer with the auditor's office. Um, today, we're just requesting um, your approval to authorize the auditor to post the notice of hearing for a budget hearing on December 27th, where, we're, where we will consider uh, budget supplements for the 2022 budget. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail on these since we'll have more dialogue um, next time, but we, um, there were um, a few funds that had more significant dollars included in there. Um, the general fund, the significant uh, supplement needs are mainly due to the 7% matrix adjustment, as well as some additional overtime that we had um, unbudgeted due to COVID in the jail and uh, juvenile detention center. Um, as well as um, the bond redemption fund. Um, that supplement is required due to the fact that we refinanced the 2010 issuance, which was not planned when that budget was finalized back uh, the prior year, as well as the capital projects fund um, had a more significant budget supplement needed due to the fact that the original budget was prior to the contract for the highway shop. Um, but again, we can have more dialogue on this in a few weeks, but today we're just asking for your approval to post the authorization of the, um, the budget supplement and the budget hearing on the 27th. Okay, any questions for Susan? I, is there any comments from the public? Okay, then I would look for a motion to approve the publication. So moved, Benninger. So moved, Benninger. Second. Second by Barth. Um, all, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 aye, those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously, thanks Susan. Item number 15 is a briefing to discuss the 2022 bridge inspections. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Commissioner. Steve Groen, Highway Department. Uh, in compliance with the South Dakota DOT requirements, we have Chris Brozick here from CDI. He's gonna summarize his findings from the 2022 bridge inspection program. Chris did meet with Highway Department staff last Tuesday. We went through all 93 structures that were inspected and I went through maintenance plans and started talking about which bridges we should be putting in our five and 10 year construction plans. We'll turn it over to Chris. Morning commissioners, Chris Brozick, vice president with Civil Design Inc. out of Brookings. Um, I'll just jump right into it if you wanna to scroll to the next slide or, okay, perfect. There we go. 
All right, so as, as Steve mentioned, CDI was contracted to perform bridge inspections for Minnehaha County again this year. Um, Minnehaha County has 197 structures on the county system on either a county highway uh, paved road or township roads. Any structure over 20 feet in length constitutes a bridge. Um, of those 997, 93 of those structures were inspected this year. Approximately half the structures are, are inspected on the even years, which this year was mainly on the east half of the state, and the other half inspected on the odd years, so next year. Um, of those 93 inspected structures, 10, or excuse me, 13 are currently posted for a weight restriction out on the, the uh, infrastructure. Uh, no new structures were, in, were constructed this year, and so no initial inspections were required. We typically, on a new structure, just for your information, we, we are required to perform an initial inspection within three months of that bridge opening to traffic, mainly to document its performance and condition shortly after the construction has been completed, and to make sure that it gets put into the uh, regular frequency for inspection. Um, I've, I've talked last year as well about just kind of our overall process of what the inspection process entails, and I'll just go through that again briefly for you guys as a, as a recap. So again, this year we uh, completed inspection of 93 structures. It's hard to see on this map, but I did highlight all the structures within the county map. Basically, the majority of the structures located are east of Interstate 29. So a lot of the larger structures that the county has over the Big Sioux River, Split Rock Creek, those were all inspected this inspection cycle. And as I mentioned, uh, 13 of the structures that we inspected this summer do have a current weight restriction. The good news is we didn't notice any major deficiencies that caused a increased reduction in that weight restriction. So any any load posted structure out there today remained the same moving into next year. And so we didn't have to worry about, you know, limiting any, any weight restriction on the structures out there. Also, any structure that was currently acceptable for legal loads and didn't have any weight restriction, we didn't have to put any weight restriction on any of those structures. And so overall, good news around for the county not having to implement any additional load restrictions on any structures. Um, we do have a handful of structures out there within this inspection cycle that we are keeping a closer eye on and we will be monitoring for advanced deterioration to the point where there may be a future weight restriction. But again, as I had mentioned, this inspection cycle, we didn't have to worry about any of that. Question. Yes. That picture in the lower right, it looks like those are icicles hanging off, but that <laughs> yeah. was taken in June. I mean. Great question. So that's called uh, stalactites. And basically that's a buildup of efflorescence, which is a white pasty substance that comes out of the, the concrete deck, which shows there's some internalized deterioration going on within that bridge deck. And that is getting to the point where there's a lot of buildup. And it's almost like if you were in a cave, you'll see a lot of this dripping and, and such of um, mineral deposit. And that's a similar scenario that you're seeing on that slab. And so that's an example of one that we are keeping a closer eye on for deterioration to the point where we would need to post it. Great question. Um, and, you know, overall, countywide, you know, I think the county has approximately 20 of the 197 structures currently posted for a weight restriction. But overall, countywide, I would say if I had to give a grade to the performance and the, the condition of the infrastructure um, of the bridges themselves, I would give that an overall grade of a B. So that kind of gives you a standpoint of where you guys sit from a structure standpoint in terms of overall condition. Um, so as part of the inspection process, first we have to go out and do all the necessary field work, go out and do a, a bridge inspection, mainly looking at approaches leading to the structure, then working our way onto the structure, looking at the overall condition of the deck, the barrier rail, any signage or advanced warnings uh, signage as well, just to make sure that the safety of the structure is intact. There hasn't been any impact damage on the barrier rail that would cause any uh, deficiencies. And then starting to work our way to the underside of the deck and taking a look at overall conditions there as well with, with the superstructure, any beams, as well as the substructure, any of the pier supports, 
for the longer structures or abutment supports towards the end of the structure. In addition to that, uh, as you guys knew in 2019, 2020 timeframe, there was a lot of flooding. We also do checks for scour and bank stabilization along the banks of the river or under the structure. And one thing I can report is, you know, since 2019, when we did have a lot of significant flooding and scour and bank erosion, um, a lot of that has improved over the last three years or so with not having those major storm events come through since 2020 or so. And also the, the county highway department doing a great job of doing the maintenance that's required in any repair to restabilize those areas and mitigate for any future potential erosion or scour at the structure. And so um, one thing that we do when we're out there is basically do what's called a channel profile where we'll measure depths along the, the river bank in the, in the channel itself and document that over multiple years so that we're able to compare that to previous years to see if there's been any major shift or change in that, in that channel or, or bank of the, the bridge itself. And so we can monitor that over a period of time. Once we gather all the, the field work, then we take that back and prepare a very detailed inspection report that we can provide to all, not only the Minnehaha County Highway Department, but also to the South Dakota DOT. We also prepare that information into um, what's called the bridge management software that the South Dakota DOT ultimately forwards on to the Federal Highway Administration. So all of that on a national level is also documented within the county. Um, just a few snippets of, of what a, a completed report looks like. Um, the verbiage, then, then we also do what's called an element level inspection where we break down each component of the bridge and can better determine kind of on a percentage basis or a quantifiable basis how much deterioration each component has. And along with that, um, taking the necessary photo documentation, um, not only of just the overall makeup of the bridge, but any specific deficiencies or deterioration that needs to be um, observed for future inspections. It's always great to see what it looked like uh, a few years back and compare that to what you see in the field at the, t at the current time. Finally, once we get all the individual inspection reports completed, we do what's basically a summarization that compiles all the kind of the mo most important pieces of information and put that within a few pages for the county highway department. And as, as Steve mentioned, we go through that in, in pretty grave detail, talking about all the different necessary repair recommendations or any um, potential re future replacement structures that should be you know, considered for future replacement or any major rehab that may be necessary on any of these structures. As Steve mentioned, we did meet, <clears throat> excuse me, on November 29th um, for about three or four hours to discuss all of the various repair items. And uh, as I mentioned too, you know, a lot of the scour items that, that we had on the list you know, two, three years ago, a lot of that really uh, was mitigated with all the previous repair work that the County Highway Department has done. And we're seeing the effects of that improvement um, because of all the repair work that was done back in 2019 and 2020. Um, in, in addition to the repair items, as Steve mentioned, we also help them, you know, with the, you know, future planning for structure replacements on, you know, maybe what priority um, they, they should take within their five-year plan or any, any other potential grant projects that would be out there. Um, as you guys know, the South Dakota DOT has a bridge improvement grant, and um, we've been helping Minnehaha County um, in the past with those and also moving forward. Um, there is one structure that we'd be looking at for a um, preservation application to help prolong the service life of the structure itself. It's a, one of the larger structures over the Big Sioux River. Um, and then uh, still be being determined by the highway department which, which uh, structures they may be considering for a grant application for future uh, structure design and replacement, um, but a handful worth worth considering. So um, with that, um, that's all I have for you guys. I welcome any questions you have about the inspection process. Thanks, Chris. Are there any questions for Chris or Steve? And is there anyone from the public who has a question or comment? Seeing none, thank you. And this is a requirement that they have to do every year. So, Steve. 
Um, I guess we'll move on to item number 16, because that's also Steve. Authorize the chairman to sign a contract between Minneapolis County and the Pram Construction Inc. Incorporated for project number MC21-09 and structure 50-279-140, the rehabilitation. Speaking of bridge improvement grants, this is one that uh, CDI assisted the highway department in getting a preservation grant, which we were successful. So 80% of this bridge rehabilitation will be funded by the state of South Dakota. Last, on November 16th, we had a bid opening to rehabilitate this structure. We had one bidder bid on the project, but fortunately they were within our budget for this project. We were recommending the commission approve the award to Pram Construction for $1,886,358.20. Thanks, Steve. Any comments for Steve? Any comments from the public? Okay, I look for a motion. Make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Have a motion with a roll call vote. Bender. Aye. Barth. Aye. Benega. Aye. Karski. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item number 17 is consider a motion to award the Rural Access Infrastructure Funding. Steve. Once again, Steve Groen, Highway Superintendent. We talked in the past to the 2021 South Dakota Legislature approved a Rural Access Infrastructure Fund. We received five-year plans from several townships, but we only received applications from three townships to participate in this funding. We had $680,000 available to award, and we only had $290,000 in requests. We are requesting that the commission award these uh, funds to Hartford Township, Mapleton Township, and Valley Springs Township. And all available monies not spent this year will be available for applications in 2023. And at the Townsend Township meeting, there was a lot of questions about it, yes. so hopefully there'll be more applications next year. Commissioner Kersky. They, we didn't have more applicants because of the requirements for application, or why, why do you think? A lot of townships uh, didn't qualify either with the opt-out or the 50 cent uh, road fund okay. and there are several townships looking at implementing it at their March meetings for so they'll be eligible next fall okay. 2024. 20, are these funds available for a total of th two more years total of three years three more years three more years so that you. could be extended or increased depending on the legislature okay so okay I am anybody from the public commenting and I would look for a motion to approve that Rural Action Access Funding. So moved. Second. A motion and a second with a roll call vote, please. Karski. Aye. Benega. Aye. Bender. Aye. Barth. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Item number 18 is consider a motion to reappoint Jerry Beckler to a second three-year term on the museum board effective January 1st, 2023. Bill. Good morning, Bill. <coughs> Good morning, Bill Hoskins, Director of the Sioux Land Heritage Museums. Um, I'm here today to uh, get Jerry Beckler reappointed to a second year term. The museum board as set up under the joint cooperative agreement between the city of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County provides for four citizen appointments by Minnehaha County, a county liaison commissioner, which Commissioner Barth has served in that role in recent years. And then the city has likewise four citizen appointments and the mayor or his designee. Um, and I'm here to ask for Jerry Beckler. Uh, Jerry's a retired gentleman, uh, has taught in uh, the county schools, um, done farm credit uh, work as well. Uh, he's been an excellent attendee and is currently serving as the chair of the museum board. Are there any comments from the public? Move approval. Second. A motion. And he's been an excellent chair. Yeah. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. And item, item number 19 is consider a motion to reappoint Roger Butcher. Butler. Beekler. Beekler to a second three-year term on the museum board effective January 1st, 2023. Uh, again, Roger uh, has served a first three-year term. Uh, he's he's a, been a great board member, has uh, started volunteering at the Museum Resource Center, working with the collections work as well. And we really invite that uh, kind of board involvement in the museum operation. I'll he's make been, that motion. 
Is there any public comment? I have a motion. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. And item number 20 is consider a motion to appoint John Nordley to the three-year term at the Museum Board effective January 1st, 2023. Yeah. Uh, again, John would be appointed to his first three-year term on the Museum Board. John um, has uh, a local businessman who has served as the chair of uh, the president of downtown rotary and a number of other groups and think that john would be an excellent addition to the museum board okay. he was recruited for the board by his sister uh, who's also served on the board in the past any public comment motion so moved second the motion is second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed same sign motion passes unanimously Item number 21 is authorize the chairman to sign an annual lease agreement with the Minnehaha County Historical Society. Yes, um, the Minnehaha County Historical Society has occupied a, a small office space on the first floor of the old courthouse museum for uh, ever, forever, <laughs> more or less. Yes, lo longer than I've been there. Um, and uh, this uh, lease, <clears throat> we, we, in theory, clean the office. Um, we provide heat, electricity. Uh, it is a uh, no um, rent lease and requires a unanimous vote of the county commission to approve. And it is for just one year. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, is there a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Barth. Aye. Bender. Aye. Karski. Aye. Benega. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item number two is authorize the chairman to sign the annual lease agreement with the Sioux Valley Genealogical Society. Make Again. a motion to approve. <laughs> is there any public comment? <laughs> None. I have a, can I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to authorize the annual lease Agreement with Sioux Valley Genealogical Society. All those in favor say, oh, excuse me, roll call vote. Barth. Aye. Bender. Aye. Benega. Aye. Karski. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Madam Chair, both of those organizations help out with visitors that are lost or whatever, and, uh, and they also bleed over into the abandoned cemeteries board, so they're an asset to our county. Thanks, Bill. Um, with that, we will do item number 13, which is authorize the state's attorney to sign a waiver of conflict of interest bond council. Madam Chair, Eric Vogue, state's attorney's office. Um, the, our bond council, Perkins Coy, has notified us that in their due diligence and uh, ethical responsibility that they also represent U.S. Bank on unrelated issues. U.S. Bank is likely to be the purchaser of or recipient of the certificates of participation on the Juvenile Justice Center financing issues that we are doing right now. Because they also represent the other side of this arrangement, they're notifying us of that potential conflict. It's not a direct conflict in the sense that uh, they're representing them on this particular issue, but on other unrelated issues. So I have drafted the uh, attached form that you have all received. I've added at the bottom that this uh, waiver of conflict does not extend to the potential, unlikely, but potential if there is actually some issue or disagreement between U.S. Bank and the county as to this particular financing issue. So it's not a carte blanche, everything goes kind of waiver, but just letting you know this is not unusual. Um, there are situations where uh, a firm, uh, for example, in town may actually be represent a party suing the county and then we're out trying to use that same firm on some other issue. Those are a little bit more difficult to swallow, but this is an unrelated issue. So I'd ask you to allow the state's attorney to on the county's behalf, and you'll notice in the forum it's saying that it's with your approval and consent, so. Okay. Questions? Questions from the public? Look for a motion. Make, make a, a motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Bender. Aye. Benega. Aye. Barth? Aye. Kersky? Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item number 24 is authorize the chairman to sign an amendment to the, L, or the JLG architects for the administration remodel in the amount of 
$4,600. Carol. Good morning, Commissioners. Carol Muller, Commission Administrative Officer. And uh, the construction never seems to stop right now in this uh, in this building. We have uh, we're coming. We are on the tail end. That's the good news for us to have. Um, we are on the tail end of it. I just you may have noticed today that you cannot use the stairs anymore because that stairwell is. I think we're probably thinking 50 years old for surface covers in there for the surfaces and. Uh, that's all being replaced now. Anyway, so the next step is we have enough money to make this work, and that's to finish out the hallway on third floor. Um, the commission offices um, look very nice, and it really makes the rest of the area look very tired, and it's, it's been a long decades since that has been refreshed. So we have enough money in the agreement or in the um, fund to take and do this. So before you today would be an amendment with JLG for the architecture services for this particular project. Okay. Questions for Carol? And is there any public comment? Now I'd love for a motion. Yeah, quick comment. If you want to take a walk back 40 years, just walk down that hallway 10 feet and it's like yeah. walking back 40 <laughs> years. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve that. Remodel of third floor flooring and wall covering, basically. Um, um, roll call vote, please. Bender. Aye. Barth. Aye. Kursky. Aye. Benega. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Next is public comment. If there's anyone who has public comment today, no one's moving. Liaison reports. Madam Chair. Commissioner Barth. Um, there were no appeals from last week's. Uh, a planning and zoning commission meeting. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Any others? I have several here. Um, in November, Tyler and I hosted the um, breakfast club for the county, and we just had um, we, we met out at the juvenile detention center and it took them on a tour. We had a Sioux Falls school board member, uh, Brandon City Councilor, a uh, couple of superintendents, and several councilor or several commissioners from Lincoln County that toured the building with us. Um, I think it was lots of really good questions and lots of good discussion and also um, excellent support from those entities. So um, I think we're done with Breakfast Club. Is it, it'll move on to the city. Do we have a November or December meeting? I don't think we do. So we'll be moving on to the city's responsibility come January. Um, and then um, I attended the legislative breakfast with Carol and Tyler and we um, kind of co op if you call it, with municipalities in our area and have a legislative breakfast every fall to bring our joint issues together. Um, Commissioner Bender and I have sat on that board on the backside and talked with, uh, I think Karski's been on it too. Yeah, I wasn't on this year. Okay, and, and just um, sit with the city councilors and figure out what do we have for joint legislative issues. And then we have this breakfast and bring it to the um, legislators. I would say we had an excellent turnout. We had several, um, city city staff people and city um, councilors, but there was a, I don't even know how many, but there was a lot of uh, legislators there, a lot. Very, very good discussion about a lot of interesting topics. Um, I can't even think of fun funding for um, how the, funding for taxpayers as far as they were looking for property tax relief and questions came up about, or comments about, you know, the counties are running out of money and, um, and that the state does have money, and just it was very, very good discussion. I can't, Tyler, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, so, um, we have our little list that is with the city, and we will continue to work forward. That the, the municipal or the South Dakota Municipal League supports that platform that we have come up with, and also the South Dakota Association of County Commissioners also has that as part of their platform. That's what we work for. Um, See, I have a couple more here. Uh, yesterday, there was a small group of us that met for a debriefing again on the Pima County visit that we did a couple of weeks ago. It was a smaller group. We were focusing on um, how to improve our, what we call the link, um, but we were missing a couple of key piece bowl just because of illness and stuff. And so um, great discussion, but no decisions at this point. I might think that same group will probably be, re be reconvening again just to talk about some of the positive things that they're doing in Pima County with their link-like um, buildings and how we can continue to take the next step in improving what we're doing there too. Um, not to say they're not doing an amazing job, but we're still in our first two years, and so there's always tweaks that we can make to the system. 
And then the last one was um, Tyler and I spent uh, Monday and Tuesday several hours calling all of the um, counties in our partnership for the juvenile justice system um, rebuild or expansion and had um, great conversations with all of those and support on the phone. They all um, committed to ha taking that to their commission this week, which I think all but one were today, those meetings, and getting a letter of support signed and sent back to it yet this week. Um, verbally on the phone, I would say we had support from everyone. So um, I'd say the most common comment was, we have no place to go. We're happy with Minnehaha County. We're gonna continue to stay with you. So did you have anything more to add to that part of it, Tyler? No, I think what you, you characterized it correctly, the, on, the, on the phone, the support was generally positive. Um, I was asked to speak at Turner County's commission meetings, so I've, I've spoke with them, and then Hutchinson County invited me to their meeting next Tuesday, and that's one of the, I think there's two meetings we're waiting for that are next week, okay. um, or in the next few days, so that's what's on hold for that. Yeah, so, um, so we obviously didn't have that discussion today as um, part of our non-actionable Discussion. I'm just wondering if you are ready to put this on the agenda on the 20th, which would be two weeks. If there was any other questions, um, we could try to get those answered in the next week. I think we need to have Tom Grimman um, give us a comment again about where we're at with our bond council and if there are other um, issues that we need to resolve in the next week and a half, we need to do that before we put it on the agenda for the 20th. I guess my only question or comment was, is well, there's two. Um, from what I read about recent legislative action involving especially the juvenile justice system and the three strike rule and the concerns I have about you know, how could that possibly impact what we are building. Um, I know the legislative session begins in January. We're all aware of that, goes through the end of February. I'm fully supportive of, uh, of the um, need for a new facility, but I just want to make sure that we're not getting uh, the cart before the horse in, in the sense that are we going to be building the right thing, I guess. And then the second part would be, um, and this is, I was going to add this to my you know, liaison report, but um, the Legislation, our legislators had a summer study on the regional jail authority, which as of yesterday, they are including um, in their language that it will include juvenile detention centers. So when it, we talk about a regional jail, or I'm sorry, yeah, regional jail authority, um, it would include the ability to include a, a JDC in that discussion which would really impact the governance of a facility and um, probably be more binding, as you're talking about in all our partner counties, uh, binding on those counties um, to um, be involved in it, but it would also include the ability, um, just like a township has the ability, in a, or a road district has the ability, that regional jail authority would give authority for um, a mill rate of, I believe, $2.10, might be $2.40 per thousand to fund the construction of a facility. So a lot going on there, and until we get through this legislative session, I, I just have a lot of questions, so I don't know if it's too soon on December 20th. I am supportive of a new JDC, but I think we have a few things going on that we really need to keep our eye on. Commissioner Brenda. Microphone. <laughs> that, Sign. that when you and Tyler talked about talking to the counties, you didn't really talk about that. What you're really proposing to the counties is a completely different relationship than we have right now, where it wouldn't really be the same contractual relationship we have right now. It'd be more towards an individual bed rate, which I also think that the commission needs to understand that and and understand how that fits in the finances and. So I, I do think that there are some, I think that there's some communication and some decision making that needs to come before the commission 
so that we can make sure we have all the facts before we can actually vote on the bond. And I'm I'm with Commissioner Karski. I'm supportive of the, of the um, idea. I just want to make sure that we all have the same information and that we understand exactly where we are and how that flows through the financing um, before we vote. Madam Chair, I'm sorry. No, uh, go ahead. You know, uh, we never have all of the possible information on anything. Uh, you know, we don't know what the flow of the Big Sioux River will be in five years, uh, et cetera. So we make the best decision we can with the information we have. And, uh, you know, I guess as a short timer, I sort of would like to get some of this stuff done uh, before I go. And let me also say that uh, Bill Hoskins says he doesn't want the statue. <clears throat> another, another conversation, Commissioner. Uh, I will just say that I'm part of the Juvenile Justice Oversight Council, and we met by phone last week. There were 23 of the 27 or 28 people on the call that are part of that group. There was conversations about the three strike and out process. I'd say there's going to be a need for some clarification on that because actually to just go back to the basics, there's some conversation about going to the legislature and with the research council reappointing some of the members and changing the composition of what that uh, group is going to be in the future. And there were representatives from the governor's office who had alternative uh, kinds of uh, suggestions. So we will be meeting again before the legislature meets to kind of discuss some of those pieces. It seems like there is a census that there's going to be more people from the educational field than from the uh, legislative field to say the least. So I'm not sure exactly where that's gonna go because that has not been recommended or put into a, a written form at this point. The other thing that uh, I would say there's some con conversations about is the fact that uh, how people are representative in each of those counties is important to some of the uh, superintendents, so to speak, and how much information they get from the sheriff's department and about what's going on with victims and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of pieces of information that need to be vetted. Uh, I'm also part of the safe home group and uh, we talked about some policy changes with background checks uh, and standards for the risk of people that we uh, put into those programs and then they were very complimentary of uh, our building supervisor, Mark Krenz, about how much money they had saved this year because he had entered into contracts with utility companies and there was a significant line item savings because of his negotiation. So uh, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when we're gonna meet with it. the next meeting. They were supposed to be sending out a uh, invite but I have not seen that on the Juvenile Justice Oversight Council, so when that happens, I'll have more information probably about the three-strike conversation. Um, I'll be blunt, I don't even know if I'll be on that committee because there's multiple people that are uh, wanting to be represented. There's a lot of data behind um, some of the stuff that Commissioner Benegar was talking about and the data doesn't support that very, mer that very many more kids would be sent to the Department of Corrections on the Three Strikes program. It's very small. And talking to Jamie last week, our juvenile detention director, um, he said if those numbers, if that Three Strikes was used and we did get a couple more of those kids, it would just prolong their stays in the juvenile justice system because there's no place to place those kids and that already is the reason we have kids with Department of Corrections is because there's the difficulty of placing those kids as elsewhere. So if the three strikes happened, we would, our, we would probably see our population grow by one or two instead of deteriorating by one or two and maybe three. I don't, it's not gonna be a huge number, 
because the data that they have been collecting for the last five years yep. does not support that, even with the three strikes, that the judges are making the wrong decisions. Um, the judges have been making the right decisions and have that latitude to put those kids into Department of Corrections when they feel that that's the necessary avenue. So I guess I will have more conversations in the next few days with the rest of you and figure out where we're at and if any of those um, questions can be answered in the next week. So we have about a week and a half before it has to be given to the commission to be on the agenda for next week. Um, so I'm, we'll talk with um, Tom Grimman too and find out where we are. I think we have gained a little interest um, since we talked about this about eight weeks ago and so that means a little less building and a little more interest um, in order to keep it in that cap. So we'll just make sure we know where we're at with that and if that holds true. And so um, with that, are there any non-actionable commission discussion? I think that was kind of it. And I would look for a, a motion to recess. Um, Kim, do we have a lot to sign? I would say let's do, do 10 minutes. That basically puts us at, at 1032. And are we in the room next door for executive session? So motion, motion to recess. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 As opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously.